Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 658 of the Juice Box Podcast. Today's show is with Grace. She has type 1 diabetes and also lives with body dysmorphia. I think this conversation is incredibly enlightening. I really appreciate Grace coming on the show and sharing her story with us. I want you to remember while you're listening that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. I just got a note from the T1D Exchange. They are thrilled with how many of you filled out the survey last month in March, but they still need more of you. They need your answers to those simple questions. T1DExchange.org forward slash juice box. All you need to be is a U.S. resident who has type 1 or a U.S. resident who is the caregiver of someone with type 1. You go to T1DExchange.org forward slash juice box, join the registry, Fill out the survey. Takes less than 10 minutes. When you do it, you're helping people with type 1 diabetes and you're supporting the podcast. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Today's podcast is also sponsored by Dexcom, makers of the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor. You may be eligible for a free 10-day trial of the Dexcom G6. Head to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box to learn more, or you can just get started. My name is Grace, and I'm a type 1 diabetic. How old were you when you were diagnosed, Grace? I was 18. And now you are... 27. Okay. That was nine years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Right. Doesn't feel like it. Yeah. Do you, do you know the trick on that one? What do you mean? Well, you're 18 and then 27. So one and two are only one away. Oh. Right. <laughs> and, and, yes. Yes. Yeah, and then the eight and the seven <laughs> were only one off. So boom, just like that. Because if it was like you said, like, you know, 18 and 28, I'd be like, boom, 10 years. They can't. Anyway. Yeah. I don't know. It's just. <laughs> no, that's very true. I, I was actually doing the math last year on my birthday and I was like, wow, I've only, I've almost been a diabetic for 10 years. It's kind of crazy to think that I'm coming up on my double digits yeah. anniversary. No, I know. We should really talk about that. And cause I'm just, you know, I'm just, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm boasting a little bit about my math. Really <laughs> so, Your math skills. They're yeah, out of the world. I did. I just wanted people to notice how quickly I did that. <laughs> um, okay. So just about a decade. Uh, diagnosed in your late teens. Can you tell me a little about a, a little but what was that? A little bit about being diagnosed? Yeah. So I was in college. I was a resident assistant. So I lived on campus all year round because I stayed for the summers as well. And I think it was my sophomore, it was in between my sophomore and junior year when I was um starting to feel like really crappy and I wasn't sure why I assumed it was because of my workload and that I wasn't taking care of myself. I was sleeping all the time and my friends like to put it in perspective. Grey's Anatomy at that point had 10 seasons and I watched all 10 seasons because of how little I was doing with my time because I was just constantly exhausted. Um, and so because I was feeling crappy and the term was over, I set up a doctor's appointment and at the time, my aunt lived next door to us. And the morning of my appointment, my mom called her and was like, yeah, like Grace is just already asleep on the couch. It's not like her. She's usually awake and ready to go. And so my aunt was like, all right, I'm coming over. Just let me know if she throws up. And at that moment, I literally was like, mom. And I ran into the bathroom. So my aunt <laughs> ran next door, tested my blood sugar. It was unreadable on the little machine that she had. So they drove me to the ER right away. And of course, with my aunt being a nurse, I got in right away and I did all these things. And honestly, it was all a fog yeah. uh, at that point. But yeah, I was in there for about a week. Um, my 
I guess without eating, my blood sugar was over 750. So yeah, I was just chilling there. My A1C at that point was over 16. So I was cruising this, this, uh, (laughs) this way for a while. They said, well on your way. I have a couple of questions. (laughs) I I think you might've answered one of them, but why, why was your aunt so aware of you might throw up because she's a nurse? Because she's a nurse and I, I don't know because I was asleep at the time. I don't know what my mom was saying to her on the phone that made her think along those lines. Yeah. But, you know, because my aunt lived next door, she obviously saw me when I came home from school and I had lost a lot of weight. I lost over, I have to say, I lost over 35 pounds in three weeks. Wow. And I had started going to the gym. I know it's so silly to even think like in hindsight, I started going to the gym two days a week. And when I started losing weight, I was like, wow, like I'm, I'm doing this thing. I'm doing a great job. And that was not the reason. (laughs) So I think she saw that and all these other things and something triggered in her brain. You were probably sitting in that gym thinking like, I'm going to be rich when I sell this idea to people. It's three sit-ups, a jumping jack. (laughs) And then you sleep. Walk on an incline for 10 minutes. Yeah, you watch you watch a little bit of Grays back when, you know, the cast was right. Yep. And uh, you're like, oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. Arden told me the other day. You're on your way. She goes, I never finished Grey's Anatomy. I just started it over. And I was like. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel like there's two types of people. Those who started from the beginning who just keep rewatching it until a certain point, And those who are just jumping in now. Ugh, it's just two different generations of watching Grey's. They don't understand. Anyway. They don't. No. I mean. I don't want to just tell you, but when O'Malley died, it really started to go downhill for me. <laughs> oh, my God. It was like the turning point of destruction in my brain. It was okay. not great. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to have been able to put that sentence together. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> so you get in there. You have type <laughs> one. It's only nine years ago. So, all right. Mm-hmm. Um, are you like... Is your family stunned that you have diabetes or are they like, oh, this is what happened to Aunt Gertrude? Like, you know, like what level of right. awareness did you guys um, have about type one? Definitely stunned. Definitely stunned. I am the only one in my lineage at this point that we know of that has type one diabetes on both sides of my family. But what was really cool was that my uncle had had married a woman and she had type one. So my parents leaned on her a lot, which was really nice. Um, But she also learned about diabetes so long ago. So our conversations don't exactly match up. And it's kind of funny because now she asks me about Omnipod and those things. So I actually got her to switch from her Medtronic to Omnipod. And so it's kind of like, again, with that generational thing, she was able to relay her experiences to my parents, which I think they benefited from. Mm -hmm. And then I get to have these conversations with her and we get to discuss and she she talks to me about how to write appeals. So it's really cool. How to write appeals. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. What what were were you in college (laughs) for? Like you were there all year round as an, like, were you just a dork or were you doing something scientific or what? So, (laughs) so I, I, have to say I loved living on campus because I had my own space um and when I lived on campus as a freshman that was what my parents had said they said you can live on campus we'll pay for you to live on campus for a year but after that you have to figure it out or you have to commute and so during my first year I had my own RA and he was great and he had said you know you might make a good resident assistant so then I applied and because of that I just Kept say. living the lavish life of having an apartment for free. <laughs> I see. Yeah. Better than not not better than home, right? You did. You it sounds like you visited. Like I did. Yeah, I did okay. visit, but it was for like a weekend. Mm. Or my family we used to do Friday night pizza night every week when I was a kid. So I would come home for pizza night, stay on Saturday, go back up, and things like that. Grace, but you, I really did enjoy being on my own. <laughs> yeah. Do you think it broke your mom's heart that you wanted to leave so badly? I think she was devastated because when they moved me on campus my first year, she kept asking. She was like, do you want me to help you put this away? You want me to do this? You want me to do that? And I had said to her, I was like, no, no, no. I got it, mom. Like, I'm good. 
And my dad was the one who had to kind of like usher her out. And I saw the heartbreak on her face. <laughs> <laughs> you got the first 18 years. I'm going to take the rest of them. I need you to go. Right. Yeah. Well, right. Look at you. Like, I was the test child. So I understand being sad that I'm no longer home because I'm definitely her right hand. But yeah. I very much enjoyed my independence. Gotcha. Um, any other brothers and sisters? Sounds like yes. Yes. I have two younger brothers um, that we're each two years apart in age. Okay. So we're, we grew up really close together. You, do you want me to do it very quickly for you? 25 and 23. Very, <laughs> yes. Very good. Very thing. good. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to have to, I won't bore you with how I did that, but it's pretty, <laughs> pretty amazing. Um, any other autoimmune in your family or even like, uh, like, let me throw some out at you. Uh, hypothyroidism, celiac, um, a ton of allergies, uh, bipolar, like anything, anything. Yeah. So got? we actually are a pretty healthy family. Mm. For a while, we thought my cousin had celiacs, but she ended up um, just farting. All it up. wasn't. Yeah, she yeah. had some other issues going on, <laughs> um, but it wasn't celiac because at first I was like, oh, great. Like we're on the same team, but no, we not are not. Even. Wow. You um, really are all alone on an island then within your family. I am. You know I am on my own island. Beyond your, um, you, you know, beyond your aunt, aunt that has type one also? By, yeah. By marriage type. Yeah. By marriage. Um, yeah. Is there um, anyone else in your life that has type one diabetes? I have friends who have type one diabetes. Um, there's actually, there's three of us and we're actually all connected on my like fiance's fit friend side. So I actually went to college with one of the girls I'm friends with. Mm -hmm. And we went to college. We were in the same major, but I didn't know she had type one diabetes at the time. Okay. But now after kind of getting back together after meeting my fiance's friends and she was a part of that group, now there's three of us who all have type one and we're called, we call each other the Dia Buddies. And uh, yeah, we kind of lean on each other, which is really cool. Excellent. Um, so what do they give you in the hospital when you leave? You get pens? So yeah, I was on pens for about a year. Uh, actually, probably shorter than that. Probably like eight months I was on pens. And then I switched to Omnipod. Oh, that quickly. All right. And do you use, yeah. the, do you use the CGM yep. at all? You know, Dexcom, Libre, anything like that? Yep. I have the Dexcom and I'm now on the Dash system. So I have the Dexcom and the Dash. Oh, are you thinking of doing Omnipod 5 when it arrives? Um, It's it's a thought. I'm not, I'm not one to like so quickly switch, mm -hmm. especially when I enjoy routine. And the Dash is still fairly new to me. I only recently was able to get coverage for the Dash. Um because of the new health insurance that I got from my job. So congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Um, the one good thing about having to switch jobs is that I got better insurance. So um, yeah, I, I'm still getting used to the dash, Okay, but you know, nice. we'll see what happens on the horizon. Yeah. That's hilarious that you said that grace for reasons you don't know. Um, when they <laughs> first made the Omnipod five, do you know what they called it? I, I'm pretty sure I heard you speaking about it called the horizon. It was right? called the horizon. Were you saying that on purpose? <laughs> were you were you punning? No, I wasn't. Oh. I wasn't. It's definitely like a 2020 recollection. All right, because if you were doing that, that's some next level pun, and I appreciate it. <laughs> um, I'm not that skilled, no. you know. I'm getting there. <laughs> don't don't knock it. You're doing great. So, um, so you, how long have you been listening to the podcast? I've been listening for probably about two years. I have an hour commute to my job, so I listen about two hours <laughs> every day on my way to and from work with sporadic breaks for music, but yeah, pretty I, regularly. It's okay with me if you listen to music, just as long as it's, oh, yeah, thank you. as long as you consume, as long as I come back, right? Yeah. yeah if you consume two episodes <laughs> a day. I think whatever you else you do in your free time is fine with me. You know, now oh, lovely. Hey, yeah. if, if you're only getting in one a day or a half, then I'd like it if you'd just kind of, you know, rejigger <laughs> your life and rearrange it so yeah. i could get that full t second episode in there i'm working pretty hard over here grace and i would like to be paid <laughs> back okay so yes, um yes. no no so you've been <laughs> listening for about two years how did you find out about it so that's funny how did i find out about it i think it was on instagram i saw a post that i follow a bunch of i guess you could say celebrity diabetics um who are really just people who have their pages and content 
<laughs> focused on diabetes. So someone had posted about it. They had shared something about how they were listening to an episode and it hit them really hard. So in a good way, obviously. Hopefully. Um, and so then I looked it up and I started from the beginning Thank and you. chugging along. I honestly don't even remember what number episode I'm on because I'm just, <laughs> I'm constantly listening to it. It feels like it's a stream of conversations, which is pretty cool. Oh, do you have any like confusion about knowing me? Do you have that going on? Do you ever talk to me? Anything like that in the car? Mm -mm. Yeah, good for you. Look at you all rock solid in your head. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. <laughs> um, so, so what made you reach out? Because I, your topic is, uh, I mean, I'm done chit-chatting now because your topic is like utterly fascinating to me. And I just wondered first, what made you want to share about it? So I was listening to a bunch of the um, After Dark episodes because again, like the topic that we're going to be discussing, it kind of, it does fall on like the mental health spectrum. So I was listening to um, a couple of after dark episodes and I was kind of almost like waiting for one, you know, I was like, Oh, I can't wait till they talk about something that I really can get into. And I just kept listening and no one was saying anything about it. So I was like, Grace, are you here because let I've let it. you down? <laughs> yes, I'm devastated. I must represent. <laughs> Grace is like, if this idiot's not going to follow through on the things I need to hear about, I'm going to have to do it myself. <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you I'll by now, you there's got to be 50 people who have been on this podcast who are on because they wrote to me and said, do you have episodes on this topic? Um, I go through this. And I said, well, I don't. But if you come on, then I will. And, you know, that's how it happens a lot. So I appreciate you doing this very much. I don't know anything about this. So can you explain explain the first time you had the feelings and what they were like and how it's either changed, morphed, or stayed the same and et cetera, please? Gvoke Hypopen has no visible needle and is the first pre-mixed auto-injector of glucagon for very low blood sugar in adults and kids with diabetes, ages 2 and above. Not only is Gvoke Hypopen simple to administer, but it's simple to learn more about. All you have to do is go to gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Gvoke shouldn't be used in patients with insulinoma or pheochromocytoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk. With the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitoring System, you can make knowledge your power. Now with the Dexcom G6 CGM, you can make better diabetes treatment and better diabetes management decisions with zero finger sticks and no calibrations. The Dexcom G6 lets you see your glucose numbers with just a quick glance at your smart device or your receiver. You can get alerted when glucose levels are heading high or low. Hi, why did I do that? Or low and share your data with up to 10 followers. And the Dexcom G6 is covered by most insurance plans. If you'd like to get started today with the Dexcom, go to Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. If you want glucose readings right there on your smart device, customizable alerts and alarms, and no finger sticks, you want the Dexcom G6 continuous glucose monitor. Head over there right now and take the next step with Dexcom. Fill out a tiny bit of information and get the ball rolling. This afternoon, we used Arden's Dexcom G6 to navigate an impending low blood sugar. We were able to stop it with a little bit of food and keep from having a rebound high. That's just one way we use the Dexcom G6. You may find others. As a matter of fact, I know you will. Dexcom.com forward slash juice box. There are links to Dexcom, Gvoke, and all of the sponsors at juiceboxpodcast.com and right there in your podcast app in the show notes. There's little show notes in the podcast app. They're clickable links. Use them, please. All right, let's get back to Grace. We've only scratched the surface. The rest is incredible and upcoming. So why don't I stop talking so you can listen? I live with bi dysmorphia and I, it, 
it started even before I had diabetes. So I was a competitive dancer and I myself, I'm just stronger, more muscular. My family is, you know, as they say, big boned, but I was never a fat child, we'll say. But in comparison to other dancers, I was on the outside, we'll say. So I was always looking at myself as bigger than I actually was. And even to this day, I look at myself as bigger than I actually am. Mm -hmm. So when I got diabetes and it was pre-diagnosis and I lost all that weight, I even then did not see the weight fall off which is half of the issue that I had when it came to being diagnosed. Cause in the hospital, they're like, okay, how, like, have you lost any weight recently? And I was like, no, I really haven't. And my mom and my brother were there and they were like, yes, you have. And even like listening to my brother describe how my face looked, he was like, you looked so sunken in, like your skin was kind of just like hanging. I didn't see that in myself. Mm -hmm. I didn't see any of that. Because I always perceive myself as a heavier girl. It, it, and can I ask you? Sorry. No, don't be sorry. Yeah. I, I just want to ask a question. Please say no yeah. if it's not right. Can I give context to your height and weight, or would that be bothersome? No, you? absolutely. Okay, so, I am 5'7. Right. And I currently weigh 215. Okay. B- back when you were diagnosed? I was 5'7", and I weighed 138. Okay. All right. And so that was prior to 138, was prior to the diagnosis or after the weight loss? It was, It so when I was weighed in the hospital, I was 127. So the 138 was the last time I had weighed myself prior to being diagnosed. I understand. Okay. Because all of my classmates, they're like, oh, you're looking so great. And I was just obviously being fueled by that positive, positive, I'll put in air quotes, positive notion that, oh, you lost weight. You look so great. So I wanted to see what my number was. And I was like, wow, like 138, that's like fantastic. I've never seen this number. Even when I was in high school, I I never saw that number. So I was like, wow, like the gym again, the gym, I'm doing so great. So you, um, see, greatness came from a, because you saw a number shift, but would, can you recall back? Did you look in the mirror and see a different uh, like a difference? I didn't. No. And even now I I look back on pictures, like if I'm scrolling to embarrass a friend for a birthday post or something, and I scroll back through all of my photos, I don't see that change. I am the same body. Even, even when I look at pictures where I'm at my smallest pre-diagnosis, definitely sick, I don't see that. Okay. So as you scroll, is it, I mean... Let me just, I'll jump forward a second, then I'm going to jump back again. Like, did you seek some sort of treatment at some point? I did not. You didn't. Okay. I did not. So when you scroll through those pictures, do you go, like, is there something that happens in your brain? Do you see yourself and think, oh, there I am. I look terrible. There I am. I look terrible. And no matter if you're, you know, what weight or health situation you're in, like sunken in face, not sunken in, about to find out you have diabetes, you know, using insulin. Is it all just the same feeling when you see yourself over and over again? Yeah, I have to say, doesn't matter what picture I'm looking at. If I'm not a child looking at like baby, young child pictures, every picture that I have taken of myself, there's always that feeling of, ugh. Okay. You know, and Thankfully, I have an amazing therapist now who I talk with her very often about this because for a lot of people when it comes to body dysmorphia, because there's a large number of people who actively and know that they suffer from body dysmorphia, but a large population of the people on this planet suffer from it in some way, shape or form on like a minor scale. Mm -hmm. And after my therapist was like sharing that information with me, it helps me recognize that People who I perceive as perfect also have their own issues, obviously, with like how they look and their bodies. And so I have to kind of step away from that. Oh, I want to become that or I want to do that. Right. I imagine so I imagine that that it can go in either direction as well, too, right? Like you could see yourself at a um I don't I don't know how to put it actually. You're gonna have to uh, 
excuse me, because I don't know the terminology around this, but let's just say you're, yeah. you're at an unhealthy weight and you don't see yourself that way. You could just look in the you look in the mirror and be like, I'm doing well, you know, and then, yep. you know, but be 30, 40 pounds overweight and it actually be Im- impacting yourself, but you don't allow yourself to see that. So that's sort of the, that's the same idea. It's just not in the in the direction that we think of it when we like usually what we think is, I mean, don't you yeah, I'm generalizing now. Right. But when when I hear body dysmorphia, I think of I, I mean, honestly, I think of a person who's, you know, who looks better than they feel they look, I guess is the mm-hmm. very simple way that I think of it. Do you think that's accurate? No. Yeah, that's definitely inaccurate. And probably the more perceived understanding of body dysmorphia is from the, let's say, let's use like a general, like an athlete who sees himself as not in their actual body. They see themselves as overweight or not fit or something like that. But it does go the other way where there are individuals who have body dysmorphia where they are larger or they have more weight but they see themselves in a younger, not a younger, in a lighter frame, which again, could be detrimental to their health. And I, I can't speak from experience because that's not the body dysmorphia that I experience. but there are people out there that I've seen on these, um, I don't want to say chat rooms, but like on these Facebook groups that I follow that talk about this, there are groups out there who are like, oh, just went to the doctor's office and they said this on the third, but I don't see it. Guess I'll discuss this in therapy this week, you know, kind of a thing yeah. where there are things that impact your health when you are at a heavier weight, things that have to do with like circulatory system and blood pressure and all that, which yeah, right. will have an out- outlasting effect on your health. So yeah, it definitely does, does go both ways. I'm going to do something a little boring for a second, but this is from hopkinsmedicine.org. Okay. Bo- body dysmorphia is a mental health problem. If you have BDD, you may be so upset about the appearance of your body that it gets in the way of your inability to live normally. Many of us have what we think are flaws in our appearance, but if you have BDD, your reaction to this flaw may become overwhelming. You may find that negative thoughts about your body are hard to control. You may even spend hours each day worrying about how you look. Your thinking can become so negative and persistent, you may think about suicide at times. Um, and then it says that uh, the cause of body dysmorphia, excuse me, the the cause of body dysmorphic disorder is thought to be a combustion of environmental, psychological, and biological factors. Bullying or teasing may create or foster the feelings of inadequacy, shame, or fear of ridicule. So did you ever feel bullied or did the situation where you were at dance allow you to bully yourself, if that makes sense? Yeah, definitely a, a- I am my own bully kind of way. Um, I had to say growing up in grade school, I had amazing friends. My school was um, like looking back now, I know being an educator myself now that it wasn't this way, but it was literally a fairy tale. I had amazing friends. Everyone was friendly. We always, everyone played together. So I never got that external pressure or external commentary on myself, but it was always internal. Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a little more from this website just because I think it's interesting. It says that this affects women and men equally. Um, Mm -hmm. they think that, um, factors contributing could be family history of this or some similar mental disorder, abnormal levels of a brain chemical. doesn't say which one, uh, your personality Mm -hmm. type or life experiences. Is there any, has anyone else in your family come? Like, I guess the question first is, are you very open within your family about this? Um, I wouldn't say that I've said to my family, oh, yep, I suffer from body dysmorphia or I live with body dysmorphia. I've never gone out and said something like that, but my younger cousin and I, we are very similar. And she recently had an incident where she bought a really cheap pair of pants from H&M. If anyone's looking for jeans, don't buy them from H&M. But she bought them and she went to bend down to play with um, the family dog and her pants ripped. And I, on her face, I literally saw the emotion that I feel inside when I'm about to bend down to do something, the fear and the realization that my biggest fear literally just happened. Um, So I know that I'm not the only one in the family who, who experiences these types of feelings, but 
no one really talks about it at all, which okay. is the hard part. Yeah. Is it um, like an omnipresent thing? Do you open your eyes in the morning and think, I don't like the way I look? Or is it, do you have to see yourself? Or do you have to be put in one of those situations where you're like, oh God, I'm about to reach over my head. My stomach's going to stick out of this shirt. Like, does, like it, how does it present itself to you? For me, when I wake up in the morning, I don't feel anything. But when it's I, when I'm starting to get dressed, that's when I start to be overwhelmed by the thoughts. And so I try my best to set up my outfits the night before because at that point, I'm so exhausted that I'm literally just putting together clothes that I know fit me and that I know look good mm -hmm. because I've worn them in the past. Because if I wait until the morning of and I'm in a rush or if I'm running a little bit behind, then it becomes this entire event. And so a self strategy of mine is to try and do that. Okay. So ahead of time, I'm not, you know, You're dealing with that issue. Yeah. So if, if, if you've, uh, I see what you're saying. So you pick out the clothes when you're tired and being tired kind of stops you from having the thoughts as much, I guess. And then in the morning, because the outfit's been chosen, you don't ha you don't go through the, th the same thought process as you would when you're standing in front of the closet. Right. Because okay. as soon as I stand in front of the closet and I have all of my options there and I'm awake and I'm ready to move, then my brain goes, oh, I can wear that. Oh, actually, I can't because I hate when this happens. Or, mm, I don't know. This grabs I don't my, think I fit anymore. This grabs my stomach. You can see my arms and this. Like, that kind of stuff goes, like, yes. starts happening. Okay. And, yeah. And, but then, where does it go from there? Because, I mean, I'm not comparing, but I've stood in front of clothing and thought, well, I can't wear that. And, but I, mm -hmm. I don't then feel badly about myself afterwards. So, does it right. spiral? How does that what happens after when it all starts, where does it go? It is definitely a spiral. So I would say I have created a system for myself for when it comes to work attire, but God forbid we're going out or we're socializing with friends or things like that. And I, I have to then go outside of what I'll call like my work capsule wardrobe. It is a, an entire event. There have been a handful of times where I've, where I've literally just sat on the bed and my fiance's come in and she's like, we're not going are we? And I'll be like, you can go, but I'm not going, mm -hmm. which is when it becomes the issue where that now it's impacting, it's impacting my life and my daily experiences and things such as that. Okay. Do you have any other thing going on? Are you, would you consider yourself to be depressed or anxious or anything like that? Yes. I'm also, I also have depression, which runs in my family. So I am working on that as well. Um, so there are other things, there are other mental health factors okay. and such as that. So, so and this is a personal, but isn't it funny where the line gets drawn in my head? I'm like, Oh no, no I'm going to ask a person. You've been talking about this <laughs> body dysmorphia for 28 minutes. I'm like, I hope this isn't too personal. Um, <laughs> but I just had that same experience. You know what? It's going to be in an after dark. I'll let you find it. You'll enjoy it. Um, <laughs> uh, so you're with somebody. Right. Mm -hmm. So does the fact that they think you're attractive not help you? It does feel not better? register at all. Okay. So, at all. So then what happens at sexy time? Do you lay there like, oh God, like please let this end. She can see me? Or like I don't how do you I don't know what happens, I guess. Yeah. So so <laughs> interestingly enough, so now my fiance is very loving. She is very caring of me. She, she goes out of her way to tell me what she sees in me of me, what she thinks of me and, and like my body and everything. Right. But anytime we're going to get intimate, all lights have to be off. I'm already in bed. I'm underneath the covers. Like, I don't want you to look at me, okay. which has been a topic of conversation for us because she obviously doesn't see what my, what my vision of myself is. Mm -hmm. And no matter how many times I try to describe it, it's something that is hard to compute for another person who's looking at me. Yeah. Your dog can't even understand it. I know so, she's so bad. I'm sure saying. the mailman is literally <laughs> standing outside. She's so bad. Well, I, I think the, 
one of the things that it brings in and that makes it so difficult is if the other person is looking at you and being like, I very attracted to you. So, and you're, yeah. you're keeping that from me, I guess it could feel like on some level, and then they could start feeling impacted by it. Like there's something up with them and that's why you won't share yourself. Yes. With them, and yes. Slippery and slope. we've had that, have that conversation as well, because I don't initiate any form of intimacy like that, because again, how I feel about myself. So we've had to have the conversation where I've had to share with her, like, yes, I find you attractive. I love you. I want to do this, but I am not comfortable with myself to Mm -hmm. do this. Okay. So then it does, it impacts her own mental understanding of, okay, now am I unattractive? Does she not love me and my body? Which is not the case. It's all, it's all my issue, Mm -hmm. but again, bleeding into that type of scenario you know does it um impact like even functionally are there positions you won't get into or things you won't do just because of how you feel like your body is going to look in that situation oh yeah i i have to say it's not i haven't experienced anything like that like i'll definitely hesitate but then she'll be like come on like let let just try it Mm -hmm. so it's definitely there is still hesitation and there is still concern and like a self-awareness of, okay, how am I going to look in this position? Yeah. Um, but. Sorry. Yeah. I have another question. This one's going to sound, yeah. this one's going to sound like less than tactful probably, but I genuinely want to know. <laughs> um, this might be a male perspective thing. I have no idea. We're going to find out in a second. Is there a part <laughs> in the process where you just tip over the edge and you're having such a good time. It goes away. Like, can you ever let go? Like, not that you can let go of it, but you know what I mean? Do you ever get like, right. To a point where you're just like, I would do this in front of my mom in the mall. I don't care. This is very good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I have to say if, if I'm sober, no, if there's alcohol involved or some other type of, you know, elite, uh, something that will alleviate the focus from me, then yes, I'm able to kind of have that. I want, I don't want to say out of body experience, but it definitely feels like that because I'm not thinking about myself. Okay. Grace, did we find your, did we find your line? Did you just stop yourself from saying if I'm high? (laughs) (laughs) I would never. (laughs) I I was like, "Uh uh-oh, this girl was very open right till she got the weed. Then she's like, "Mm." not saying that out loud. It's not, it's not often. I'm, I'm more of a gummies girl like I won't like smoke it so much but I am I am a gummy I like eating (laughs) gummies and treats and such so so if it's in there I'm not gonna say no I uh can I say girlfriend or fiance does it matter to you no it doesn't matter okay so if she sees you grab a gummy do you think she like run and change the sheets and everything (laughs) she's like (laughs) This There's is a it. high probability. She starts unscrewing he, light bulbs out of the out of the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> Turn all the lights off, make sure the sheets are ready, but in a little corner so Grace can just slide right in. She yeah. Take, <laughs> takes her phone, puts it on private. She starts texting friends. It's happening. Leave me alone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, no one contact me until I reach out, please. Oh, my God. Can I ask yeah. a question that's completely disconnected of all this? Yes. How great is it to be in a same-sex relationship? Because I assume your periods have linked up by now. So the same time that nobody <laughs> wants to have sex, nobody else wants to have sex either. <laughs> it must be amazing. Yeah, I have to say, it's it's quite great. We are we're pretty synced off by a few days. So when I start, she knows it's coming, and she's the baby out of the two of us. Where she will, she will milk it until the cow is dry. Uh, <laughs> she will complain and all this jazz. So as soon as I get mine, I'm like, hey prepare yourself because we call it, um, we call it Nelly. So we can talk about it in public. We'll be like, Oh, is Nelly coming this week? Or is Nelly coming next week? <laughs> so just, I'll be like, Nelly's coming for you. <laughs> I'm just thinking like, how great must it be to like, not feel sick to your stomach or something, or, you know, just blah. And no, just intrinsically, your partner's not going to paw at you right now. Cause she's in the same yeah. exact situation. <laughs> Whereas <laughs> in my scenario, I'm like, wow, the boobs are way rounder now than they usually are. <laughs> and then she's like, I don't feel good. I'm like, ah, Scott doesn't care. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So I'm just saying, it seems like a match made in heaven is what I'm getting at. Right. Um, yep. That's yep. excellent. We have our uh, we have our ritual of murder mysteries or <laughs> crashing into some crazy series. And then we go back to our normal routine until next month. <laughs> Did you try murders in the building on Hulu? 
So I haven't watched it yet. It's on my watch list. Um, and she hasn't started it yet because I told her I wanted to watch it. So Good. it's fun. I enjoyed it. I really enjoyed yeah. Steve Martin and um me and too. Martin I love Short him. It was very good. And Selena Gomez didn't bother me, so I thought it was great. So nice, she nice. Was she was good. I there was part of me that was like, I don't want to watch this Wizards of Waverly girl. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> but she was she did a good job. So Yeah, uh, I haven't seen Selena Gomez in any shows like uh, since w- Wizards of Waverly Place. I haven't seen any of her other movies, so I have no real perception of her acting skills. So this is a good review. Thank yeah, you. You'll be good. You'll you'll enjoy it. I um and I was also just a little mesmerized and uh, proud of myself when I pulled the Wizards of Waverly Place reference out because <laughs> as I was saying it, I was a little like, "Is this a Jake and Josh thing?" And I'm getting this wrong. So right. Anyway, which channel? <laughs> Who are the other actors? What is it called? So, so moving the kind of like the the sexual problems into the real world. Do you have things you avoid doing in your day that people don't know about, but you're very aware about? Like, is, like how are you coping? In real life. So, so it's actually interesting you say that. So of course I, it is. I'm amazing at this, Grace. What are you talking I know about? I mean, you are a professional. <laughs> what was I thinking? Five seconds ago. <laughs> uh, here's what I knew about body dysmorphia five seconds ago. There's a person tangentially in my life who I think is having trouble with this. And I don't know what to do for them. And, mm-hmm. and, and other than that, um, besides me, you know, fooling myself into thinking I don't need need to lose weight at a couple of points in my lifetime. I, I don't have any real like connection with the idea. You, you, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm doing an amazing job understanding all this. Plus I got you to talk about <laughs> lady sex, which I think people are going to yeah. love, you, you know, and um, I'm done. Oh, listen, I'm doing really great, but, but You're doing fabulous. <laughs> fabulous stuff. let's just stop in the middle so I can congratulate myself. <laughs> <laughs> We always need that moment to pat ourselves on the back. Well, you know. joking aside, like, you know, again, for 30 seconds, I'll turn this around. But if you ever want to, like, have pressure, put yourself into a scenario where you're having a conversation with people that's going to be recorded and then heard by a lot of people <laughs> after that. And you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. So right. it's, um, <laughs> it's uh, you know... I'm not without risk here, too, let's just say. I could come off like yep. at some point, and I'm always going to share the episodes with you. So if I sound like an idiot or sound so, I say something stupid, uh, it's not like I'm cutting it out. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're just going to be yeah. listening and going, oh, my God, this! I, why do I listen to this podcast? I didn't know what to ask this girl. Um, right. <laughs> anyway, I'm giving myself a lot of credit. I think I'm doing good. You're doing great, by the way. Um, oh, are, thank is you. there any apprehension about talking about it? Um, Not so much. Because I'm kind of like taking this meeting as sort of like a, a therapy session. That's how I'm, kind of how I walked into it, so that I didn't have any reservations. <laughs> you know, I hear because if a I lot. went into it like pretending I was talking to somebody that I've never met, that I've only heard through my my car stereo, it'd be then... a weird thing to tell them. Yeah, yeah. In a half an hour, I got you <laughs> naked. So yeah, you did. That's quite you're, impressive. You're way too easy, Grace. <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> all right. So in your regular life, those things that we kind of like were able to see because, I mean, honestly, because making it into a sexual situation simplifies it. But does mm-hmm. anything about that carry into your regular life? I think that. I, so I'm an educator. So I work with sixth graders, and I think that. In my everyday, if I see other staff wearing something that I really like, I will automatically be like, oh, but you could never wear that. Because with, so with my job, we have like a very strict dress code. And sometimes it's hard to find things that I actually am like, okay, I could wear this to work and not think about the slew of issues that I would foresee my body having with this specific garment. And as soon as I see someone else in something that, I would love to wear, but I'm not confident or I don't feel like I would even look good or even fit in it or if it would just accentuate something that I'm trying to hide automatically. It's like everything goes down the toilet and I'm spiraling with it and I have to kind of reset my brain. So when I go into the classroom, I'm like, okay, we're not talking about this anymore. So there's a lot of compartmentalizing in my life when it comes to that, but... Do um 
I'm thinking back on being younger and being in school, and I can't remember the woman's name, but I remember torturing as a group. You know, it wasn't just me. It was a pitchforks and pitchforks and <laughs> of kind of a thing. But we tortured a substitute teacher to the point where she cried. And, and I, I'm looking back, I'm starting to feel bad about it, but I'm trying to be honest, Grace. Okay. <laughs> so um, does that, like, has that, like, what would happen if a kid called you short, fat, ugly, stupid? Like, what if they leaned into you on something like that? Do you think you'd crumble in front of them or do you think you could hold it together? Like, so I have a pretty tough exterior when it comes to my students. So a little background, I work at a deaf school. So I work with a smaller group of students than a typical public classroom. Mm -hmm. so, so I have 18 in comparison to other schools where they're like high 20s, low 30s. So I have a pretty close relationship with a majority of my students. I have yet to come across a single one who would say something maliciously like that. If it were to be the case, then... I feel like I would kind of put on my like tough face and have that conversation with them. But then maybe on my drive home, I would be obsessed with that, with that thought and that comment and possibly take something out of that capsule wardrobe that I have for work. Gotcha. Talk about the obsessed part. Like how long would it last? What would it entail? Do you ever have thoughts of suicide like the website talked about? So I've never had thoughts of suicide myself. Um, so I have to say I'm, I'm grateful for that. But with the obsessiveness, it can last a very long time. Like an example, I had a shirt that I used to wear in college that. I don't know. It wasn't like a professional shirt. It was something that I would wear if I wanted to look nice when I was going out. But it was, I would say it was like my comfort shirt. Nothing could go wrong with that shirt. Mm -hmm. And I remember someone had made a comment about how I always wear that shirt is the only shirt they ever see me wearing and how it's starting to look worn out and it doesn't look as good as it used to. And they automatically that shirt went in the garbage. Yeah, and I it. thought about that comment every time I went out since. So it's just like something like I don't even have the shirt anymore. And I'm still thinking about, oh, like, I can't keep wearing this item because it's going to be oh, used so against you, me. Oh, so you start thinking like even the stuff you like now, I can't overwear because it it'll get worn out and then I'll have to throw it away. So now you're yep. not. And I'm going to lose that option. You see, oh, so you're not wearing it to save it to keep the option, but it doesn't help you functionally. Right. Ooh. Oh, you poor thing. Um, okay. Me. Oh, yeah. That's, no, that's <laughs> I mean, that's terrible. Um, do you speak? Uh, I don't know if I'm doing this right. ASL. Do I say do I ask if you speak ASL or do I? So I, I use ASL. Mm -hmm. I am fluent in ASL and I teach in sign language and communicate with my students through sign and my friends through sign. So it is a it actually, funnily enough, it has an impact on my sugars. <laughs> if I am working, my sugars are stable. But if I'm like distance learning like I am this week, my sugars are much higher because I'm not putting as much effort into my day, if that makes sense. I would like to see you up your basil when you're um, when you're working without that. From home? Yeah. Yep. Because you're saying that yep. you're up and moving and signing. So you're literally active. And so you, yep. need, you need less insulin because of that. Yeah. Oh, I wish I would have known about this when we were making the variable series. Uh, series. I definitely would have done <laughs> ASL as a variable. That's uh, just really interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. Do the, do the kids know you have type 1? So some of them do. So interestingly enough, um, the way that my class is set up is that my co-teacher teaches social studies and I teach science. So fifth grade, we talk about the body and the systems of the body. So when we talk about um, the immune system and things like that, the textbook mentions diabetes and that's kind of like when we use that half hour to learn about diabetes, the, uh, the co-teacher and I kind of work that out because I am a living example of yeah. a, an autoimmune disease. So having that conversation with them, most of them understand my past years, they really had a better grasp on it than this year's. But again, with distance learning, everyone's a little behind and takes more time so I tell yeah you, but it's been pretty cool i feel so bad for those kids because if they can't 
they can't hide on distance learning like the kids who can hear can. Because if you have to sign, then you have to be visible in the camera. The other kids just hide. Right. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> exactly. Just, you can just see the top third of their me. forehead. Yeah, yeah, they just show the top. <laughs> the other day, Arden said to me, I slept through a class. I was like, oh yeah. She gosh. goes, yeah. She's like, bed learning. And I was like, yes, I know. <laughs> um, we call it bed school yeah, no. here. And um, it's back again after New Year's. Um, I, mm-hmm. we just got the email as you and I were sitting down that they're going back again. So, um, yeah, we're going back on the 18th and my students definitely do better when they're in person as many students do, but when they're home, obviously there's other distractions. So I'm very excited to be back and my kids miss it because a lot of them, this is like school is their only place where they have seamless communication. Mm-hmm. So they're very excited to come back. Yeah. Do some of them live in homes where they can't communicate with people in their homes? Yeah, I actually have a lot of students who are from Spanish-speaking families. So not only is there a written language barrier, but there's also the fact that some families don't sign with their, or they don't have in-depth understanding of ASL, so they're not able to fully communicate with them. So Uh, You just blew my mind. Is ASL one standard language? So if I come from a Spanish-speaking household or I come from a French-speaking household, we both do the same ASL? So, no. So, every country has their own sign, um, their own sign language. American sign. Sorry, I'm an idiot. Yeah. (laughs) No, no, no. You're totally fine. Uh, It's actually a a huge misnomer that, you know, the thought that sign language is universal, it actually isn't, which is pretty pretty crazy. Um, So, if I were to go to another country, I may not be able to communicate with the deaf community there because we're using two different types of sign language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So Grace, like I'm looking at a photo of you right now. (laughs) Yeah. Because we're zooming (laughs) and like it popped up. I have a silly photo. You have a nice photo. It's fine. And um, if I said to you right now, just out of left field, if I said, Grace, I see your picture, you're very pretty. What's your first reaction to that statement? Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> like You're, you very ex- polite. You can, ex- but do you believe it or you're just being polite? I'm being polite. Okay. So what are the words that pop into your head when I say that? Nah. Just like that. <laughs> it's just not quite. Okay. Yeah. So, so you- or like he's being nice. He's trying to be nice. I see. How did you end up with a partner then? Like, how did you believe somebody enough like to, to date them? So we met in a very interesting class in college called um, death in perspective. So not death with an F death, like TH at the end. Mm -hmm. And that class, it really forced us to be vulnerable and um, share really intimate experiences of ours. And because we were in that class, it was kind of as if um, there were no more secrets. We, we spent a lot of time together Um, and after we both graduated, we were both single and we kind of just met up as if no time had passed. Mm -hmm. So the comfortability was there that there's nothing, I have nothing to hide from her. Okay. There's no, there's no more secrets. She knows basically everything surface level. So, yeah, you've, um, Again, I'm doing my best. Let's keep in mind I'm 50 and straight, but you've always you've always been gay. So I had a boyfriend in high school, um, but that was it. Okay, so you were not <laughs> every what they partner w- after that. You are not how they would refer as a. You are not gold star. Then is that correct? I am not gold star. Mm-hmm. Look at you knowing your terms. I'm pretty impressed. I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is better than when I knew how uh, long you had diabetes after doing a simple math problem. Uh, lovely yeah no i am not a gold star okay. i'll let people look that up on their own i'm not explaining everything to you people um, yeah <laughs> just, let's just say scott knows things that's all yeah all right? i'm old yeah. but i'm keeping up you're keeping up you got it ish i'm keeping up ish <laughs> meanwhile my knee hurts for three weeks i don't know why <laughs> I didn't do anything to it i just woke up one day and i'm like what is wrong with my knee Right. My ankle is the same way. I have no idea what happened to it, but it is tweaking like no other. Kelly, Kelly's like, are you going to need a knee replacement? She's like, oh, God, am I going to have to take care of you? And I was like, oh, my God, I hope not. Um, I just don't want I feel she could leave me in a room to die is my concern. Like, if I couldn't get around, like, what would stop her from just not bringing food and water? Right. You know what I mean? So 
she'd be like, oh, I can finally get this insurance money and get started again with a guy I really like. Right, right. <laughs> I can build a whole new life for myself. Yeah. I mean, it's not too late <laughs> to get away from this idiot. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I think I, I, this is not me wrapping up with you. It's me. It's me making sure, like, is there something I'm not asking you that I should be? So not so much asking, but so um, my body dysmorphia has had a huge play in how I handled my blood sugars in the past. So I'm not trying to like write the script for anyone here, but if like, obviously if your sugars are higher, you're not as controlled, your body will then start using its own self to kind of fuel, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So in the beginning when I was like, Oh, like I lost all this weight. Everyone on the outside is like, wow, like you look great. I want to maintain this. I was not keeping my sugars in check because it meant that my body weight number was going to be lower. So you were exercising like diabulimia on purpose kind of thing (laughs) to an extent. I wouldn't say diabulimia because I wasn't doing excess exercising, but I was not, um, you were keeping your, I was not calculating to cover the sugars coming in. Okay. So you kept your blood sugar high on purpose because you knew it would keep your body weight down. Correct. Okay. But you, you described your weight now versus your weight then like nine years ago, like, like pretty differently. So what are you doing or not doing now? Like that, like, I don't know. How are you living now that you weren't living then? Yeah. Um, I, (laughs) I have a endocrinologist who is extremely, extremely supportive, but she also yells at me in a very supportive way to get my sugars in check. And like, to kind of remind me that, you know, having high blood sugars is not good for a long sustained healthy life. Mm -hmm. And with the things that I'm actively working on with my relationship, with my job, with my schooling, I want to be around long enough and healthy enough to be able to continue doing them so that all of this isn't to waste. Um, So she yells at me when she's like, you know, right around the holidays, I'm always higher because I, I'm lazy or I don't calculate a right amount or I eat more than I'm supposed to or whatnot. And she'll yell at me. She'll be like, was this you on purpose or was this on accident? Okay. And so she will, she will check me when she sees high numbers for long periods of time. And she'll kind of guilt trip isn't the right word, but it definitely makes me think about, all right, like, obviously that wasn't a good, a good thing, especially if it was on purpose. It's not on purpose nearly as often anymore, but it definitely was in the beginning where so, she was like, this is on purpose. I can see that there's a trend here. You're thinking about this and the third. So, yeah. So if your weight hits a number, then you stop using as much insulin to try to drop the weight. Right. She, okay. and she noticed that trend, I would say probably within the first year of us being together. And she's like, all right, we're going to nip this in the bud. So this doesn't go forward. So yeah, I'm very fortunate that I have someone who is medically aware and also in tune with me enough to be able to make the right comments. That'll just make me see things a little bit differently. So I'm on the right track again. Okay. I'm going to ask a couple probing questions. If I make you uncomfortable, yeah. you'll tell me. So, um, you are, I hate to use the number, but you, uh, I mean, you just described your weight as probably being 80 pounds heavier than when you were diagnosed earlier. Is that yeah. about right? Okay. Um, so how long after diagnosis were you like actively keeping your weight down by not giving yourself insulin? And then at what point did you start using more and is your, like, what do you attribute your weight increase to? Yeah. So I would say the first year after diagnosis, I was very good about keeping my numbers in check, doing what I was supposed to, because I was living with my parents at the time and they were, you know, they were asking their questions. So I, again, wanting to be the perfect golden angel child firstborn that I am, I was like, no, 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 everything's great. Like everything's perfect. And then I noticed the weight gain. So it was my second year. uh, I would say the second year and a half that I was like, Ooh, like I can, I can play with this. And then I'd lie to my parents essentially and fudge my numbers. Be like, no, they're great. When in fact they were much higher because then the weight loss was happening again. And I was going down that same trail that I was prior. Yeah. Um, and then switch doctors 
she noticed the trend about a year in. So I would say it took about three years for a professional to recognize the issue and look at all the facts and be like, okay, like we're going to work on this mentally as well as physically. Mm -hmm. Um, And so now the weight gain is definitely the weight gain that I have now is more attributed to the fact that I'm not going to the gym anymore. Um, I, (laughs) I am a full-time teacher and a full-time student. So I'm in classes all night. And I only have time on weekends to really do things to see family and friends. So um, at this point, the gym is not a priority for me. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the weight gain, I think, definitely comes from the fact that I don't have a routine. And I'm, you know, with COVID, we were so sedentary. So we had all that going for us uh, in a way. So, yeah, that's kind of where I'm at right now. And it's not where I want to be. But I'm definitely... I have a support team enough to go about it the right way. So I'm looking forward to that. Are you, um, I have a question that I'm, I'm I'm skipping, but I'll get back to in a second because I'm not sure how to answer. (laughs) Um, are you comfortable telling me what your A1C is currently? Yeah. So my A1C right now is a 6.4. Do you have a ton of lows or no? Um, I, it's kind of weird. It, it really depends on the day, like what's happening, but I have experienced more lows, um, recently, mm-hmm. but I think it's just because I'm like over calculating or overcompensating and thinking I'm going to eat more when I'm not, but it's not like your last day once he was 7.9 and this one's 6.4. Correct. Okay. Correct. Some stability. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, I'm not sure if this is okay. Well, you know what? It's over now. Like, I mean, just it, you're here. You've, you've opened yourself <laughs> up. This. this is your fault. So um, I have. Yeah. I'm an open book now. <laughs> um, are you overeating? Are you eating? Um, are you eating things that are like incredibly unhealthy? So not on a regular basis, but I do have an issue with also like sneaking food. <laughs> So, um, if there are treats in the house, I will sneak treats and then eat them and try to get rid of the evidence. And then I'll do it again. Cause I got away with it. So there is a amount of, um, overeating or not eating the right things, which is hilarious because on the outside, it's like, Oh, I meal prep and I have this, that, and the third, and I have my containers and everything's measured and weighed out because my, my fiance is big into the gym and she's big into working out and eating right. So we have this meal plan and it's great. Um, but because we're not the only ones who live in this house, <laughs> there are also treats here okay. that when I was living on my own, I didn't have that issue because I just never bought them, but who, who I these, do sneak, sneak food. <laughs> who, who are these mother? that put treats around the house and what what can we do about i know that? Ugh, i'm trying to get rid of them but yeah, <laughs> i'm poor <laughs> oh i see I, I see what you're getting at um have you so i don't know if this is um actually like i was just gonna say i don't know if this is like gonna be triggering for me to ask you but i think we're beyond that so have you considered yeah. um an intermittent fasting schedule so i I have tried intermittent fasting and I'm definitely better when I'm on my routine, meaning waking up, going to work, going to work, not just like sitting at my desk, going to work, coming back, going to class. Like I'm much better with that because then my eating times result around my availability to eat. Like my intermittent fasting is after our first period when the kids come back and then I finish as soon as I get home from work around like 430, I'm able to eat by five before I go into class. So I have that intermittent window, but when I'm home, home distance learning, teaching, and like all that jazz, I, it's like a free for all. Yeah. So no, there's no, I can go anytime that the kids are independent working or a bathroom break or a water break. I get a break. So I go downstairs and I see what's, what's happening in there. What's in the cabinets. And yeah. Gotcha. Okay. I mean, I'm not trying to say that there's some simple fix. I'm just trying to put context to it. Like, you know, my, oh, yeah. my real feeling here is that I don't, I mean, I don't know how people deal with stuff like this. You know, like I, the, I, yeah. I, I don't know what you do. You know, I mean, you're doing talk therapy right now. Is that right? Yeah. With yep. a, a psychologist. Yes. Okay. Um, 
may I suggest bit just based on the people I've spoken to in the past, move up to a psychiatrist. Mm-hmm. Might be so I have I have yeah. that for depression. Okay. I have a psychiatrist who does the depression meds, but we haven't done anything for anything else yet. So. Gotcha. I see. Uh, do the depression yeah. medication put weight on or make it harder to lose weight? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Um, I haven't like done a lot of in deep rate research about that specifically because again, like on the side of the bottle, it has all those you know, side effects or whatever, but I don't, I didn't see a correlation between my, uh, weight increase to when I started taking those meds. Okay. Do you want to, um, exercise or is it not something that pops into your head? I am lazy in nature. (laughs) So I am not extremely excited when it comes to going to the gym. I know it's good for me and I've seen better sugar levels and, not as many highs and lows when I'm doing it. So there's that motivation behind it. But if I was a full, typical, healthy person, I wouldn't be the, the person to just run into the gym and enjoy it. I think the only form of enjoyment was when I was dancing when I was younger, because that's, you're working out without thinking about it because you're just having a good time. Do you, maybe I need to do something like that. Are you more comfortable? Like this is kind of, these are going to sound like they don't go together, but because you don't see yourself well, no matter what, is this just where you're more comfortable? Is it like, is there any chance it's a decision? Like, are you trying to match your body to how you feel? Like, I don't know. Like, I don't know what I'm asking you. I'm literally rambling. Yeah, now, but that's actually, no, I, I see the path that you're on. I feel like that's actually a really good theory to test because if I feel like crap, then I don't do as much because I am crap basically. And then if I were to work out, but still feel like crap, it's like, well, what's the point? Cause I feel like crap. Yeah. Almost like that. you're putting in all this work, but there's no reward because you're going to feel like this, whether you weigh a hundred pounds or 200 pounds. Right. Right. I could be incredibly That's a good insightful. Theory. Yeah. Grace. Actually, you, wow. should, you should send me a copay for this. I think I'm going to take four. You know, I, I should, I seems, should. Seems reasonable. <laughs> um, I just don't know like that. And there's one other like indelicate question that I don't know how to ask. And I'm not sure if I'm going to sound like um, I'm not sure how I'm going to sound when I ask it. And it's what's (laughs) stopping me because I don't have any ill intention with it. It's just it's an observation. Yeah, I'm really trying to figure out if I'm I don't know if I'm going to let me drink water. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Um, I, I have friends who are lesbians and Mm -hmm. sometimes i feel like one person in the partnership puts on weight to appear more masculine Mm -hmm. did i do it i don't know what i just did like i feel no no i I, I hear what you're saying okay um so actually between the two of us my fiance is the more masculine one and i'm the more feminine one okay so like examples is a wedding she wears a suit and I wear a dress. So it's not so much that I'm putting on the weight to appear more masculine because that's not the quote unquote look that, or the, <laughs> the, for lack of better term role that I portray. Okay. Um, hold on if a second. I have to clear my throat. I apologize. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> I don't think this is the end, but it's close. <clears throat> <laughs> it's like the coughing is a signal. Um, so the reason I asked is just because while I'm doing this, I kind of have myself in a bunch of different head spaces. And one of them is I'm trying to think about what the people listening are thinking. And it's just, I'm not going to say it's obvious, but I'm not the first person who's noticed that, I guess is what I'm saying. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And and so, um, I just wanted to get the question out because I didn't think that was what was going on. But then if I don't ask the question, then the conversation feels incomplete to people who are listening. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, my, my fiance is definitely more masculine and she per, like, that's how she sees herself. Whereas mm-hmm. I don't see myself that way. Yeah. I'm just yeah. heavier. Gotcha. Listen, I, I mean, I don't even know what to say. I, wanna, I feel like I want to wish you good luck. Like I, like I feel like I'm, right. I feel like I'm pushing you in a rowboat out into the ocean. I'm like, you'll probably be okay. Here, take a banana. Uh, yeah, but with you. Yeah. Um, how long have you been working on it? Um, like per, with a professional. How long have you been at this? Uh, three years. Okay. 
Yeah, I think it's only been three. Do you see this as an eating disorder coupled with body dysmorphia? Or how do you think of um, it? Um, there's definitely there's definitely um like eating disorder issues that underlie. Like when I was younger, I was uh I I would like hide what I was eating. My mom was very strict when it came to what I ate and because when she was growing up, the way you look equates to how healthy you are. So she was always lean, very, she was a soccer player, all that jazz. So those things that she learned growing up from my grandmother, she then instilled in me. So God forbid I wanted a pop tart. I'd have to sneak a pop tart upstairs, eat it, get rid of the evidence, AKA throw it under my brother's bed so that the boys who could have all of this were the ones who were yeah. implicated <laughs> in the stolen pop tart. Be, be, so yeah, yeah, like be skinny so a boy buys you a house, like that kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly, okay. right. exactly. <clears throat> gotcha. Well, so, that's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> oh God! Um, my next After Dark that's coming out. So mm-hmm. you and I are talking in real time, but it's a little easier with After Darks because they happen. I don't sit on after darks as long after I record them, I guess is um, so the, yeah. the next one that's going to come out is with an old uh, gentleman who has an mm-hmm. eating disorder and he talks mm-hmm. about how he dealt with it. And it's fairly interesting. Like, I think you'll like it. Yeah. So. I'm excited. I, I appreciate after darks that are like that because there are a lot of overlappings of feeling and experiences in some ways. Yeah. So yeah, I look forward to that. I, um, I have the one that's coming after that is with a sex worker, mm-hmm. a female sex worker, oh. and she came to the podcast through another After Dark episode. So that's cool. Yeah, I, I oh, I'm a, excited. A really good feeling about them, actually. Um, th- just what they do in general, not those specific episodes, but what the series does. Um, yeah, you know what I mean. Like it's so easy to say, like, well, I'll do uh, an episode about pre bolusing because people need to know about that, and everyone will want to know. But yeah, you know you. you you don't expect when you're doing things like this that you're going to get a note from someone who's like, Hey, I'm a sex worker who found your podcast because someone in another episode admitted to doing cocaine regularly. To doing this. And, yeah. And like so, how so do I, so I want to come on the pod. And you're just like, wow, really? Like these are emails. Yeah. I did not expect to get in my life, but, um, th- I think that's it's, really cool. Yeah. I think it's building a really great little, um, compendium of, the other stuff that nobody wants to talk about who obviously, I mean, listen, I make a crazy generalization here, but it, it, there's nothing about you physically that mm-hmm. I would look at and then jump to any of these conclusions about you. And I know that, right. I know that that's not, that's the case for everybody, mm-hmm. but I don't think that's how people think about it. Like I, I, I think that, you know, we don't see, we don't see, struggle until we see broken i guess right usually yeah and you no that's so true yeah, yeah because you if you were to meet me on the street i would seem as if i got my shit together i am like focused i've got all these things going for me while on the inside i am digging myself into this deep tunnel about a glance that you may have never even intended and right. been like oh damn like they were looking at me for this on the third you know, but so, on the outside, you don't see that. It's so funny you say this. So I was leaving a convenience store last night, mm-hmm. and I'm just going to be very honest and use my honest words, right? And I saw <laughs> I saw a really pretty big girl. Yeah. That's all, okay? Like, I don't know another way to put it, okay? She yeah. was super curvy, and, you know, if you held her up to the scale at the doctor's office, I bet she needed to lose 100 pounds, uh, you know, yeah. if, if that's how we're going to measure her. And I thought yeah. she was really pretty. And I found her attractive, and I, as I crossed by her, like, I don't, listen, Grace, you, you don't have a penis, so you don't know about this, but <laughs> I I physically can't not look at her. Like, I just, like, like my, yeah. my brain's like, maybe we should make that one pregnant. Like, it's just a very weird thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's yeah. hard to, like, quantify what it is to be a boy. Um, right. <laughs> but I, I looked at her. And I tried to smile in a friendly way because then we made eye contact. And it wasn't creepy. It was just glancing. Like, we were just passing each other. I never even got to ogle her like I was hoping to. I know that's – I'm just being very (laughs) honest right now. (laughs) Um, So, um, 
because she because we made eye contact, like friendly passing eye contact. And I smiled and I thought I saw that in her face. Like that, yeah. thing, that thing you talked about earlier. Like I thought I saw in her face, I'm fat, don't look at me. Yeah. You, you know, and I, and there was like this small part of me that wanted to look at her and go, I think you're really pretty and then just leave. But I didn't do that because th- that, that would be wrong. And so I just <laughs> left. But so then I started thinking as I was walking out, does she just keep her eyes down all the time? You, you, you know, yeah. you know, like that kind of thing. Like, does she not want to see people because of stuff like that? Um, yeah. And, and then you're actually funny today. you say that. Yeah. yeah, it's funny you say that because my ex in, in college, I always walk with my head down and she used to have such a, a feeling about it. She's like, you always look down. Why aren't you looking at anybody? And it's like, uh, because I don't want people to look at me. Mm-hmm. I don't want them to look at me because I'm not happy and I don't I don't want to see their judgments because it's just going to bury me even further than I've already buried myself. Yeah. And it was a it was a constant thing. She she would always I don't want to say nitpick, but she'd always be like, pick your head up like your neck's going to hurt. And she would try to be nice about it. But I knew that the argument that we were about to have about it, it was just like a cyclical thing because I always walk with my head down. Yeah. You know what I I think, if I can be super honest, the saddest yeah. thing I think about your situation is that not once have I heard about you wondering about how to get out of this. Like, it, it does it feel like it's never going to stop? Yeah, it's def- I, I feel like it's almost like, I hate to say it, but like a lifetime commitment. Like, I'm in this for the long haul. And I can talk till I'm blue in the face. I can pay for the best psychologists go on whatever medication that doctors feel is best but i feel like this is a a ingrained feeling that i can't ever separate myself from right so if that's the truth and i'm not saying it is in order that i know it is but if it is is there a world where you can just start looking at your physical body as your health and say to yourself, okay, I'm never going to feel good about how I look, but I can at least be healthier. Because you did talk about wanting to stay alive and do things. Like that you were yeah. clear about earlier. Yeah. And it's definitely, it, it, would, it would be almost like a homework assignment for myself. Like anytime that I see myself having to actively say, okay. This is like, you're given this many hours today. How many, how many different ways can we be healthier for ourselves? Instead of looking at it being like, oh, like I have to walk through the world looking like this today, Mm -hmm. you know? So having to give myself that literally like homework and have it be a everyday assignment, every day of every minute assignment so that, you know, it's so easy to start in the morning and be like, okay, like I'm in this great, bright, happy mindset. I'm going to be healthy today. I'm going to make healthy choices today. And then something happens and it changes it all. So that's why it would have to be a constant homework assignment. You know what I mean? Yeah. So when something happens, then you fall into kind of those like sneaking food, like that kind of like you yeah. fall into that situation. So if I may, it does feel like you have multiple things happening. Like, I don't think it doesn't seem like all of this stems from one thing. Like, I don't think this is just yeah. being depressed. I don't think this is just body dysmorphia. I, I think it, it sounds like there's a trifecta here to me. It feels like there's the body dysmorphia. It feels like the depression, but it, it also feels like an eating disorder to me a little bit. And, yeah. And, and there's the way, definitely been talk about that too. And okay. about how it's impacted. Um, in different ways, but I think that there there's nothing diagnosed yet. I guess I could say. Yeah, um, I think you're really gonna like that next episode that I was talking about. Um, yeah, I'm and, excited. Uh, I just wanted to be clear that when I just said that, you are talking to a guy who graduated from high school, did not go to college, and his entire like professional background is I was a graphic designer. I once did credit card collection. I worked in a sheet metal shop and I have a podcast. So try not to look too deeply into my thoughts. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? Your education comes from the fact that you talk to so many different people. You have so much more world knowledge because of all of the vast individuals you talk to because of the podcast. So Can don't I- sell yourself short. Okay. Here, I'll give myself some credit. People are like, oh, good. We were waiting for that. It hasn't happened in half an hour. <laughs> my, my, I, I want to see how I can keep people like very private. 
my wife has an acquaintance Mm -hmm. who's been very sick Mm -hmm. and it's been going on for a while. And they usually talk by like, like FaceTime. Like I said it, like you, like you're not young and that's not how you only talk to people like through FaceTime and stuff like actually, let me come back to that in a second. But you know, I keep overhearing these conversations about her illness or illness. And they, they think I might have cancer. And I'm like, what is going on? So finally, right. uh, finally, I just said to my wife, I'm like, what are her symptoms? And she <laughs> rattled them off. And I was like, her iron's low. She needs a complete iron panel. And um, and she's going to need an iron infusion. There's nothing wrong with her. She doesn't have cancer. And my wife, like, tells her that. And I guess she was just desperate enough that she went back to her doctor. She went and did it. She went to her doctor and gave the doctor my instructions. Okay. Wow. And mm-hmm. and then she got a diagnosis and she's on her way to feeling better. Oh my God. <laughs> How was, wild. It's ridiculous. I was like, <laughs> that woman's health has been saved by the fact that I have a podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like how crazy. Thing. The fact that she was literally thinking she had cancer. Are you kidding me? And all me? of a sudden. I was like baffled. That I'm like, how is no one seeing this? How come these tests haven't been run? Why am right. I the one who understands this? I really am an idiot. And I'm just like, I'm like, well, I get, <laughs> why is it me? You know? And now, yeah. the, now because it's been such a thing um, and it's gone on so long and I don't know this person as well as my wife does, like, because what I really yeah. want to do is I really want to speak to her and get my credit, but I can't. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to say thank you. I want to be thanked appropriately. Grace, I want to be thanked appropriately. Just like (laughs) if six months from now you have some sort of like awakening and it was from this, I want an email. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, you know, I'll be the first one. I promise. Yeah, I want to like, dear Scott, (laughs) thank you for speaking to me so directly about my stuff. I've uh I feel better. Credit where credit is due. Yeah, yeah. I want I want I want (laughs) that's all. I'm only doing this so people like will tell me. No, I'm just kidding. I actually, <laughs> I have to tell you, um, I shouldn't joke while I'm being serious. At the same time, I feel like some people can't separate it. Uh, but uh, <laughs> I love that that we're talking about this. I yeah. I, I really do. Um, I got to the episode and recording with the the sex worker who it'll come mm-hmm. out before you, you. So I mean, she's a she's a a dancer which is even mm-hmm. something I learned. Like she called herself a sex worker and the entire lead up to the conversation, I was like, I wonder what kind of like work she does. Like, what, yeah. am, I, what am I going to find out? Like there was like uh, almost like I walked up in the room and I was like, I mean, I guess she could be a prostitute. I guess she could be this. Like I started going through all the things in my head. Um, and then, and this is what she does. And her entirety of her story is uncommon to my life experience. Yeah. And there was time when I was talking to her, just like I'm talking to you now. And I feel the same way talking to you as I did talking to her. Like, I'm not going to record some like funeral procession conversation where we're all just depressed and we're like, oh, so you have body dysmorphia? That sounds horrible. Like, tell me. Right. Like, you know what I mean? Like, if we can't (laughs) still be people and talk so that this is relatable so that someone else might talk about it, like, I don't care. Like if, if someone listens to this later and thinks like, Oh God, he made the assumption that like, you know, lesbians do a certain thing. Like I I don't care. Like I want the conversation. (laughs) And when I was talking to her, I talked to her on like on the level that she, she sees herself. Like I didn't, I didn't judge her. I didn't actually have any judgment about her while I was talking, which is a major advancement for me as a human being. And that came from the, right. You, You know what I mean? So I don't know. I just think these conversations are much more valuable than people might give them credit for. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm very excited that you did this. I, I, I want to thank you a lot. I want to make sure that I'm not leaving anything out, but I also. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I really, I enjoyed this. (laughs) Did you? See? What? I don't know what that means. I just said, see. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I was like, see everyone, I did it. I feel see, like See, look at me. Yeah, yeah, I'm eight Another years old. Another successful conversation. I believe that I had the same feeling just now as you have when you hide a Reese's Pieces wrapper and nobody finds it. You're like, I did it. <laughs> I did it. No one caught me. No one caught me. Well, um you have a you have um listen, aside of all this and you know i'll I'll let a little like it's a not like it's a real secret but i'll let the secret out of the bag like i talked to you like in the first 15 minutes not about this 
because part of me wanted everyone else to see that aside of these like issues that you live with, you're, you're just like everybody else. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Like, you're not like, you're not the hunchback of Notre Dame, like locked up in a bell tower and, you know, completely broken. And this isn't, uh, this doesn't happen to real people. It happens to people like this. You know what I mean? Like this is, you know what I'm saying? Like I wanted people to understand, like you're, you're a lovely, pleasant, wonderful person. And this, this got stuck to you. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. And not by your doing. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I want to wish you luck, but it sounds trite. So. <laughs> I take all the luck I can get. <laughs> Go get him a killer. Like, I don't know what to say right now, you, you know? <laughs> um, and, you know, you can tell that we're winding down because now I just have what I think of as fun sex questions about being a lesbian, which I'm not going to ask you. <laughs> this would only be for my own personal, like, knowledge. Only fun. personal gain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. It would literally just be for me. Uh, so we're, let's not do that. And we'll stop now instead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. I'd also like to thank Dexcom, makers of the Dexcom G6 Continuous Glucose Monitor for their longtime support of the Juicebox podcast and remind you to head over to Dexcom.com forward slash Juicebox to learn more and get started today. Hey, long episode, so I'm going to let you go. Just want to thank you for everything you do for the show, sharing it, listening to it, downloading it talking about it with your doctors and your friends, etc. I really appreciate it. I'll be back soon with another episode of the Juicebox podcast. That was very abrupt, but it's over now. Goodbye.